Hello students. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. It is evening right now. It is uh, uh, August 27th, uh, 2020, the year of COVID. And this is the first U.S. history lecture, I mean Texas history lecture, uh, for your Texas history class. One of the things that we find um, uh, hard to do with uh, Texas history is the fact that we have to separate the myth from the uh, uh, facts in Texas history and that that's always been an issue okay so like I said we want to deconstruct the myth from the facts and that's really hard in Texas history because a lot of the myths are now construed as facts stuff like you know we can divide Texas into five states or things like um, Texas can still secede from the Union. You know, those things are not, they, they, they're not, can't secede from the Union anymore. You know, we signed the Articles of Secession. We can't do that anymore. Well, let's start from the beginning. I strongly suggest that you listen to these lectures and that you read these lectures in your, uh, in your under your Unit 1. And this is going to be Chapter 1, Lecture 1, Before European Contact. And that would be Lecture... That would be chapter one in Gone to Texas. And for unit one, we're going to go chapters one through six. Okay? So remember, it's in your book, Gone to Texas, the Randolph Candle Campbell book. There you go. Uh, so let's get started. All right? Uh, we don't really know who the first Texans were. Well, we, well, we do, right? They were Native Americans, all right? Uh, we do know that perhaps they came from... Uh, China, Asia, that they crossed the ice bridge. 95% um, of all Native Americans uh, uh, have the same lineage, okay? Uh, and for the most part, they share the same lineage as the Indians in Central uh, America, like Mexico and Central America and Peru, okay? Um, when they crossed the ice bridge, uh, scientists figured out that there's probably six mothers or six females that actually crossed the ice bridge and made it to here and from that populated the North American and South American and Central American continent with Native Americans. Now, the reason that we are so sure that uh, these Native Americans are exclusive to uh, the Americas is that the only other place that we find the DNA strands that are found in my body and in the body of other Native Americans and Mexicans is only found in the Bering Strait on the ice bridge. So what happened is, is that these Asian people congregated on the ice bridge and then they stayed there for about a thousand years and in that 1,000 years they had an extra, not an extra strand but a different strand of DNA that is only found there. Now, I will remember there is a uh, show on Netflix about a young lady, a skeleton who was found in a cenote in Mexico, and her DNA is there. Now, before we thought that Native Americans had come here about maybe 20,000 years ago, okay, or 20,000 years before the birth of Christ, uh, but now we're thinking that it's like 37,000, okay? So we're thinking that they may have gotten here a little sooner, okay? Uh, there are also other, uh, you know, hoaxes and fallacies uh, like the Malakoff man. There was, when they were excavating Lake Louisville in uh, Dallas, that they found the skeletal remains of a female and they called her Midland Mini. Um, and it suggests that maybe there was humans here 37,000 years ago that was found out with car uh, carbon dating now we also believe that there that most Native Americans here are of Asian origin because of the mound building pyramid like uh, structures that were built in East Texas that resemble the pyramids okay uh, they did not serve as tombs though they were just giant you know pyramids made out of, of dirt of earth if you go there you'll see them they're just huge round mounds uh 
when you do see them and they're, they're pretty fantastic and they would dig up the dirt in a, in a certain place and they would take it in a basket and then dump it there so it just took forever to do it uh, now let's move along to uh, uh, letter or Roman numeral B <laughs> I should put you know Roman numeral A or subsection B paleo Indian culture paleo means old okay and we do believe that we're, we're almost we're for sure that it that migration started 20,000 years ago and we know for sure that it continued up until after uh, the uh, thawing of the glacier okay I'm sorry I just have it it's late in the evening and I'm, I didn't realize I was this tired but it doesn't really matter uh, I, I need to crank out a lecture for you all uh, most of these Native Americans were nomadic hunters why <clears throat> because was an ice age so the only thing that they were doing was trying to survive and they had to move along with the uh, animals in order to hunt them but what begins to happen about 10,000 years ago is that we begin to see climatic changes that favor humans and they go from being nomadic hunters to being hunter gatherers okay so now they're hunting and they're gathering and then at that time, right around, you know, 8,000 years, they really become agricultural. That's when they, when they begin to see a religion set in. We also begin to see the hunting of smaller game animals. A lot of the bigger animals, like the bison, the mastodon, um, uh, the giant sloth, uh, they begin to become extinct and eventually will be extinct uh, they go from hunting with uh, uh, big long spears to hunting with an atlatl I recommend that you look it up A-T-L-A-T-L -A -A it's a very important uh, advancement in uh, Native American society and in addition to that you have the creation of the Clovis and the Folsom Points Clovis as C-L-O-V-I-S as in Clovis, New Mexico because that's where the first one was found uh, or the uh, or the Clovis people. Uh, I think that's where they found the first one. I, somebody told me it may not be right. Here I am telling you that I'm going to show you the difference between the facts and the myth and I just probably gave you a myth. And then the Folsom people, F-O-L-S-O-M, the Folsom Point, okay? When you look at them, they're very unique in the way that they're cut. And they have an unintended bleeding groove that is really going to help. You, one thing that you must remember is that a two-legged animal will run a four-legged animal into the uh, uh, ground all of the time. Okay? That's a very important thing that you need to, pay, that you need to know. A lot of people... And a lot of students don't realize the importance of these new tools that Native Americans had. But because we live in a modern society where we have center fire firearms that shoot, you know, at ridiculous distances and stuff like that. Uh, now, these tools are evidence that there's a warming trend because they're spending more time in crafting. They're discovering religion. They're making it up. They're painting in caves. They are, uh, in addition to that, they are uh, beginning to do some farming, you know, some uh, farming that has to do with uh, uh, corn, squash, and beans, the three sisters, the trinity of subsistence. Okay, it's very important. That, that's going to give us the maize revolution and an explosion in Native American societies, okay? Now, what does happen is, is that over a course of several thousand years, all these people are the same, but they're separated by different language groups. And that's how we separate Native Americans, by language groups, okay? That's how we, that's how we uh, did I say celebrate or separate? Uh, that's how we separate people, uh, primarily through language groups, okay? And that's the way we separate Native Americans primarily through language groups and when the, sometimes a language group will have a sub language group and then that'll be 
it'll be a different tribe but that tribe still falls under the umbrella of the big tribe you know like the Comanche uh, uh, had smaller tribes or later on we're going to talk about uh, uh, the Caddo that have the Atacapan under them and, and things like that. Now about 8,000 years ago we begin to see significant changes. This is when we see the drawings in the caves in the Rio Grande and the Pecos River and by the way you are going to have to know all the major rivers in Texas and uh, uh, the different geographic zones. I'm going to talk to you about that and there will be a picture of the uh, rivers uh, in the different geographic uh, locations uh, they start to believe in supernatural beings that they control the universe and uh, destiny right why all of a sudden it's warm they're eating the ice age ended the larger animals die off they're not being trampled on by mastodon or all these other you know, saber tooth tigers or anything like that they adapt and they start hunting smaller animals a lot more fish goes into the diet a lot more they start eating a lot of more plants and berries and nuts and the cultivation enhances their diet okay rabbits possums raccoons you name it dogs whatever they could get their hands on they also develop the arrow the bow and arrow okay and stone tools choppers drills snares mortars for grinding food clay pipes sandals mats to sleep on nets to catfish with uh, nets to catch fish with uh, baskets you, ha you see the domestication of the dog and the domestication of the turkey in in more southern uh, like in Mexico okay so you do now remember there are no horses and there are no cows in the Americas because those come from Africa they come from Europe okay Native Americans are very centered on living in kinship groups they're like extended families it's like a giant Mexican family that's been you know the brothers-in-laws and the sister-in-laws are all together or giant Irish family you know something like that something along the lines of compadres you know godparents that's what compadre means when you're a compadre you have godparented somebody so you are like a, a related through religious or political lines fam family political lines okay I have cousins blood cousins but then I have other people that I have that are cousins that are not cousins of mine but they're I consider them to be cousins of mine because my dad baptized one of their daughters or somebody's father don't uh, baptize my sister or my brother or something like that that's called compadrazgo in in uh in texas and in mexico they call it actually compadrismo but that's not that that's like a made-up word the real word is compadrazgo el, la comadre el compadre and you never know it's like wait pues la comadre are they related and it's like well no they just that they were really really good friends like almost brother and sister so in order to strengthen their family ties they baptized somebody or they sponsored uh the band at their daughter's wedding or you know it and those are very native american traditional values the whole idea of helping somebody out because one of these days you're gonna need help and if you help somebody you're you're not only strengthening the family tie but you're investing in your own uh, wellness you know the Mexicans have something called una tanda uh, or you know uh, mutual aid so societies sociedades mutualistas or insurance I mean that's what it is it's a, it's a form of insurance you know it's like that's why they get so mad when they said well I helped you when you were at your worst and you can't help me for just for this little thing so I, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent but I want to make sure that you realize that Native Americans were very 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 family centered they were very loyal to each other and they were very protective of each other okay uh, so they were also very uh, sympathetic of each other later on we're gonna discuss some of these okay 
Uh, and they always had an elder government system, okay? The average age of a Native American Indian was somewhere around 37 years of age. So anybody that made it into their 60s, you know, they, they were doing pretty damn good, okay? So that's very important. Now, let's talk about the uh, agricultural revolution again, okay? Uh, and I'm going to go a little bit more, and then I'm, I'm not going to cover Native Americans today. I'm going to get right up to them, and then, and then I'm going to let you go and then start with a cattle. So I have two subsections left. Like I said, this is just to break the ice. Uh, in the woodland area, era, I'm sorry, or the agricultural revolution, this is when women begin to farm, okay? I consider women to be like the mothers of invention. They, if it wasn't for women, I think that we men would still be like dragging our knuckles and not doing real good, you know? They start depending on corn, squash, and beans, okay? You can live on those three things with just a little bit of meat. How much meat? If you were eating like half a rabbit, uh, a week or maybe like one decent sized crappie or uh, a rat a field rat you know a good sized rat you know once a week that's plenty of protein for you to have but you know a bird a grackle or something like that that would be perfect something the size of a dog or something the size of a deer that would last a good while and it would be spread amongst the uh, among the tribe okay i'm not trying to be gross or silly i'm just telling you that native americans were always looking for new sources of protein but the cool thing about corn squash and beans is that they can be stored okay you know we have made pumpkin pie for thanksgiving from the pumpkins that we buy for halloween so we buy them in october this all october and they don't get cut up until November and they're still in good shape if they don't get wet and they don't get damaged they don't rot they have a really hard rind and they start drying from the outside so when you grow something like you know winter squash or something like that you put it in a dry cellar in a dry location it'll last a while and there's your roughage the corn that Native Americans ate was something called Teosinti okay Teosinti there's a little bit of corn like that and through hybridizing not genetic modification through hybridizing they ended up with an ear of corn that was probably that big okay and it was a dent corn it was multicolored corn like what you see at these places they'll sell you a little bushel of dry corn see how hard they are my kids and i have actually scraped the corn off of that and popped those and ground them into a flower uh, they may be ornamental but they're still edible what you have now, those big cobs like that are genetically modified, okay? And the beans, they also dry. They pick them during the year, during the growing season. They shell them, and then they put them up to dry. And, well, you know how long some pinto beans last, you know? They last, they have a shelf life of at least five years. If you... If you vacuum seal them, they are said to last. Uh, they're indefinite. They do lose their nutritive properties, but they have protein. And when you combine the beans and the sugars, the complex sugars from the corn, then they fixate or they create a chemical reaction that allows the body to digest the protein found in the beans. So they can live on corn, squash, and beans, all right? Uh, I'm pretty sure they added to the beans, you know, maybe added a rabbit to it or something. I don't know, but it was good. It didn't matter what it was. So that's what we begin to see. Now, here's the cool thing. When we see the maize revolution, women are able to breastfeed longer because they're eating corn, squash, and beans because they can store this stuff. But they're not eating enough calories that they'll continue to menstruate. So when women are breastfeeding and living on a diet of corn, squash, and beans, they're not producing enough calories or they're not taking in enough calories to continue menstruating. And when this happens, menstruation stops. So they're able to 
breastfeed their children much longer, which allows them to heal a lot better, allows the children to grow up to about two years because that's how long they breastfed their children, uh, which was perfectly normal. Uh, nowadays it's like nine months to a year uh, so they breastfed until they were two years old and then after they stopped they stopped breastfeeding they would menstruate again now I'm not saying that menstruate menstruation would completely stop but it was not something that would allow a, a woman to maybe get pregnant again if, if that makes sense okay uh, that's not the case now because if a woman is breastfeeding now and she's you know she's, oh my god I, this baby's like draining all my calories i'm i'm starving to death and it's like okay honey i'll bring you a triple meat triple cheese water burger with a super big fries and a shake we live in a society where we live where we have literally thousands of calories at our fingertips and i think that that well i don't think that that's why there's no uh, secession of, of menstruation between pregnancies because we have food at our fingertips, right? And even those people that don't, if they qualify for programs like WIC and TANF, they make sure that they get what they need to uh, have the calories to feed the baby. Now, the other thing that we begin to see is the specialization and the emergence of labor, okay? Uh, even without a uh, written language, they had a hierarchical structure. There were people that did certain things, and that is very important, okay? Because it, it begins to create wealth. Like, if you were the guy that made the flint, the napper, okay? K with, with a K N A P E R, napper, and you made the points, they weren't going to have you going out and fighting if they needed to fight. They were going to take care of you. And you were the dude that made the ammo. Now, everybody knew how to nap, but there was some that were better than others, okay? For the most part, women took care of agriculture. Men went hunting, brought in the stuff. The women would do the skinning, the furs, the sewing. Men would make bow and arrows. Spend, you know, hunting takes a lot of time the way they did it. Spend a lot of time scouting, looking to see where they were going to move next, you know, protecting but hey, I mean, they had it made, man. <clears throat> Hanging out with a family all day. Very socialist way of living. Indians were the ultimate socialists. Everybody helped everybody. They did have some weird practices that we'll talk later on, but they're weird because we don't understand them, okay? We'll talk about that later, all right? If I, if I forget, remind me, you know, how they deal with the elderly, how they deal with infants, you know? the usefulness of and the contribution of individuals within these tribes. Now, historic era begins right at 1500, okay? And right at the onset of the arrival of Europeans in um, uh, Texas, okay? And of course, the rest of the America. Uh, we begin to see distinct dominant groups by this time. And the groups that we're gonna cover here are the Caddo, and they're going to be, uh, the Caddo and the Wichita are going to be in the Northeast. The Atakapan and the Bidais, okay, Atakapan and Bidais. And they are in the Houston and Galveston area, okay. Now, if you go a little lower, like below Houston, like right around Rockport, right around the area of Rockport, then you're going to have the Karankawa, okay. And they're going to go from like Corpus all the way down well into northern Mexico. And then they're going to come out all the way until maybe Robstown. Okay, they were on the long coast, Robstown, Texas. I don't think maybe Robstown or Alice. That's about as far as they went. It, it kind of, I don't have a, te a Texas map, but here's the Gulf Coast, right? They were like along the Gulf Coast. Uh, I couldn't even see my hand there. I'm sorry. So I am going to get a Texas map later on. Okay. Uh, and then we have uh, the Coahuiltecan. Okay. The Coahuiltecan are my favorite. They were around the area of Laredo. Uh, went up as far north as maybe south of San Antonio. Maybe just a little north of Pearsall. And then west maybe almost to Del Rio. But maybe not as far as Del Rio right at Del Rio and then they would 
go down all the way until maybe Sabinas Hidalgo or maybe Monterrey. You know, that's where they were. We had the Comanche. Uh, and the Comanche were actually from Colorado. And they're always getting kicked on. And when they get the horse, uh, they uh, kind of like are on steroids now. And they were all over Texas. You know, mostly the middle. They would raid as far as Monterrey, Saltillo. When the moon was full, they, would, they were just a very nomadic uh, tribe. Uh, and so were the Apache. The Apache of Texas were nomadic. The Apache of West, deep West Texas and New Mexico were not as nomadic as the Apache from uh, Texas. They were more sedentary, okay? Uh, and they were in the West Texas Plains, okay? The Humanos, and the reason the Humanos are called the Humanos is because they are the ones that resemble humans most. They were the ones that were the most sophisticated, and they were in far west Texas, but it, along the Rio Grande, okay, from Del Rio. I wouldn't say as far as El Paso, but I would say maybe Sanderson or Marfa, you know, that area. The, the book will show you, you know, the general ideas. Some of these, some of these areas overlap. All of these Indians had a different, they were, they were all defined by language, okay? They were that different languages. When you have the Karankawa and the Kwawiltekan, they were under the same language group, but they had distinct, you know, regional idioms and stuff like that, okay? I also want you to know the geography. The last things I'm going to cover is the rivers and the, and the general areas. Geographic regions of Texas were the Great Plains, okay? Uh... And then, of course, we have Caprock Escap uh, Escarpment. Uh, we have North Texas. In North Texas, uh, we're going to have the Cross Timbers, uh, the uh, Grand Prairie area, big prairies. Uh, and then we're also going to have uh, the Blackland Prairie. Like when you go to Dallas, they have really dark black mud. And that is a lot of the rocks that were ground up when the glacier was coming through here. Okay. And then, of course, you also have the Piney Woods, which is, of course, if you get on the other side of, let's say, uh, Tyler, you begin to see a lot of pine trees, okay, especially in Tyler, okay, in that area, all right? Like I said, Great Plains is a Caprock escarpment, like from 35 on upwards, you know, it's just vast open plains, and I need to get used to this thing, vast open plains, there you go, I did it kind of theatrical there. Uh, and then, of course, I am checking my notes to make sure I'm covering it. We have the Gulf Coastal Plains, which is pretty much, again, Rockport. Houston is still considered East Texas, but the East Gulf Coast. But right around Rockport, you begin to see a change in the trees. You begin to see more scrub, more uh, huizache, tasajillo. Uh, chaparros, you know, chaparreras, that's what we call them, mesquite, mesquite and all that. And that pretty much just takes a swath around, you know, on the cone of Texas, like right below San Antonio, uh, you know, like San Antonio, and then back to Brownsville. That would be the, the, the Gulf Coastal Plains. Now, a lot of people will not consider San Antonio to be part of the Coastal Plains, and I agree, but if you look at a map of Texas, you kind of really change it not being the Gulf Coastal Plains when you begin to see really big changes in elevation. And so I would say, I wouldn't consider Laredo to be the Gulf Coastal Plains, but I would consider Laredo to be on the edge of the Gulf Coast Plains because Laredo's not on the edge of the Gulf Coast Plains. It is on the edge of the Gulf Coast Plains. It's not in the Great Plains, and it sure as hell isn't in, in Central Texas. So you've got Laredo kind of like on the n northern part of the northern desert and on the southern part of the Great Plains and on the w most western part of the Gulf Coast. So it's kind of like caught in there. That's one of the reasons it's so incredibly hot there because you have the collision of, d of hot, dry air coming in from the Chihuahuan Desert and then humid air coming in from the Gulf Coast and then air coming in from the north. So it kind of stalls in this area. It just kind of goes back and forth when it's held in place by a high pressure system, and it just becomes painfully, painfully, painfully hot, okay? 
Uh, then we have the mountain and basins, the hill country, the Edwards Plateau. That's the area that is west of Austin. Some of the areas are east of Austin. You do have a little bit of hill country land there. But once you get into, you know, right north of San Antonio, west of San Antonio, like in Elotes, or you go to Fredericksburg, or Rock, Rock Springs, Uvalde, you know, those areas, it's definitely uh, a hill country. You know, so, sometimes you would say that, wow, this is just not hill country. There's some mountains here, you know. Uh, you know, of course, if you want to see mountains, you have to go west to El Paso. You can go to, uh, I forgot the name of the, of the state park. It's not, it's the Big Bend National Park. So, I, sorry, it, my mind has slipped uh, for the evening and I'm going to remember at 2 in the morning. Uh, but anyway, in the area of El Paso, Sanderson, you see the Davis Mountains there uh, and all that neat stuff. Okay, the area of Texas almost always sees snow. All right, now if we go ahead and we're going to cover the rivers, I'm sorry that this is going into a really long lecture, but it was sort of an introduction also. The major rivers are going to be the Canadian, uh, the Red River, which borders Oklahoma, uh, the Sabine borders uh, Louisiana, the Angelina, the Neches, the Trinity, that runs through Fort Worth, okay, Trinidad, because it's three. It said it's the Trinity of God. The Brazos, which is below us, it does not run through Fort Worth. It runs west of us a little bit, and then it does go through uh, Waco, uh, and uh, it is empties out all of these rivers, empty out into the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, those Brazos, Brazos is Brazos de Dios. Uh, the Guadalupe, is, is, uh, of course, is also a major river. Uh, it's a great source of tubing. A lot of people call it the Guadalupe. And then you have the San Antonio, which of course goes through, gives us the river walk, okay? Uh, I think I mentioned the Neches already once. I mentioned it again. And then we have the Pecos River, which also uh, originates in West Texas. And of course, we have uh, the Rio Grande that originates in Colorado and then goes through New Mexico and then goes through all of te uh, uh, borders Texas and Mexico from uh, literally right at El Paso uh, to all the way to Brownsville okay and that is uh, uh, one of the longest rivers uh, in the world okay uh, and they all empty out into the Gulf of Mexico and you will be given an extra credit on the exam of identifying these you know put the right river on the right location or the right river on the on the uh, I'm gonna put a letter on the river and then you're gonna put it on the on the uh, help me out uh, the, the exam okay and it's gonna be there like what river is this and you'll see it okay uh, so that concludes the lecture for today I'm sorry I was kind of laid back but it is uh, 12.30 in the evening or 12.13. But I wanted to make sure that you all got this lecture so you could, you know, maybe watch it tomorrow. And then I'll post another one tomorrow and we'll get going like that. And sometimes I won't have time. But, you know, remember chapters 1 through 6 in your Gone to Texas. Uh, I won't pull any punches. Make sure that if you like this lecture that you like it, okay? Because, you know, I mean, like a lecture and uh, if you want to you have your children or somebody listen to it, please go ahead. Uh, if you have trouble falling asleep, I'm pretty sure that this will be great ASMR to put you to sleep. All right. And uh, uh, again, the views shared on this lecture are not the views of TCC South Campus. But these uh, views are the views of my lectures and my interpretation of Texas history. And even when I forget to put this disclaimer in there, that is that these are my views and what I believe should be taught in Texas history as I was taught by my professors who taught me the same thing. Okay, so again, uh, be kind to each other, uh, uh, wear your masks and uh, I will see you soon. Uh, good night.